Hello, um, I'm Megan. I'm the assistant director at the library and I'm going to be monitoring Zoom during this program. Welcome to Organic Gardening for Everyone with John Root. Uh, please note that Acton TV will be recording this program and so your uh, voice and image may be recorded. Um, you can leave your camera on or off, but if you do leave your camera on, please be aware that your background will be visible to everyone in this program. And again, this program is being recorded. Uh, this program is supported in part by the Acton Boxborough Cultural Council, a local agency which is supported by the Massachusetts Cultural Council, which is a state agency. Um, and without further ado, uh, we are going to do the presentation and then we'll have questions at the end. So without further ado, here is John Root. Thank you, Megan. And I'd, I'd also like to thank the Acton Memorial Library for co-sponsoring and hosting this event. And I'd like to thank Acton TV for not only uh, committing to broadcasting on several occasions, but also you'd be able to view it uh, on YouTube simply by searching for um, YouTube and, and Acton TV uh, online. So uh, I often begin my programs when, when they're in person with this uh, question, do you, do you think you have a green thumb? And there'll be some, a few hands that'll come up and do you think you don't have a green thumb and other pe people will raise their hands? But, uh, you know, it, it, it's really kind of a, a superstitious thing to believe that you don't have a green thumb. Uh, after all the sun shines uh, everywhere and uh, it rains and if it doesn't rain enough well you can always irrigate uh, and uh, those seeds really want to grow so and, and of course the soil uh, is a big part of it as well we'll be talking about that uh, as we go but first let's define our terms uh, organic gardening means gardening without synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and cultivating an ecosystem that sustains and nourishes plants soil microbes and beneficial insects so the benefits of organic gardening are, oh, healthier, more vigorous, disease and stress resistant plants. That's a good start. Safer and more nutritious produce is one of the things that people really are motivated by and saving money and labor. Uh, and if you believe that all these are true, then why would anyone garden any other way? Uh, here's uh, some detail about the nutrition. All these um, wonderful components of, of food that uh, we're learning more and more about organic produce has more of them and it has less of the things that you don't really need such as extra water nitrates are not okay uh, for our health and neither are toxic chemicals uh, now if you look at this and ask yourself is this soil or dirt that i'm looking at well soil is alive and here are the cast of characters bacteria actinomycetes which are like bacteria and kind of like fungi as well there's there's uncountable billions of both bacteria and actinomycetes uh, just a, you know a billion and, and a teaspoon of soil and then there's miles of fungal filaments in a teaspoon of soil and uh, so many algae and, and those protozoa that you might have seen in biology class and the uh, nematodes which are microscopic worms that are uh, active so here's the soil food web and you see that it all begins with plant matter or other organic matter that uh, is um, uh, waste residue and metabolites from plants, animals, and microbes. And then those uh, um, soil microbes then feed on that. Uh, and then they in turn are fed upon and it goes up the chain into the uh, animals uh, that, that we can actually see. Uh, so here is a secret that you may not be aware of that plants and uh, fungi are symbiotic with each other. Uh, and there are two different ways that they do this. On the on the left hand side, you'll see with the blue, that's the uh, fun fungi that's actually growing into the root uh, and in between the cells. But as if that's not impressive enough, uh, how about on the right hand side, we're using and this is called arbuscular uh, mycorrhizal fungi, uh, and that means they're they're branching. Uh, the, these uh, fi fi these hyphae are actually branching inside the, the cells of the root and. This is what it looks like uh, on the outside of the root where you can see that there's just a lot of action here. The, those uh, fungal filaments, now you understand why there, there can be miles of them in a teaspoon of soil. Um, and so here's what happens. Uh, those, uh, those filaments deliver water and nutrients to the root. Uh, and so they help uh, the, the uh, root absorb water uh, as and uh, they also protect the root fr uh, from pathogens that might be in the soil. Uh, so uh, plants are actually willing to devote 30% of the sugars that they make through photosynthesis uh, to feed 
these fungi because that's just how valuable their services are to the plants. The only group of plants that does not have these mycorrhizal uh, symbiosis with uh, fungi uh, are the, uh, the mustard family, like broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower. Uh, and as if that's not enough, this woman, Sarah Wright, discovered something called glomalin in the soil that one of those mycorrhizal fungi uh, actually creates. And it's a super glue that en enables them to span the distance between these microscopic particles in the soil. And um, so it, and it, and it just, uh, uh, so these uh, networks, it's almost like building a bridge, you know, uh, across these uh, gaps in the soil. And, and it just, it, so it, it creates structure in the soil and gives it tilth. Uh, and and it's, there's an incredible amount of carbon being stored in these uh, structures, and it's a very highly stable form of soil, soil carbon. So who knew? Uh, uh, no one knew until 1996 uh, when Sarah discovered this uh, substance called glomalin that uh, that carbon was actually being sequestered in the soil and uh, much more than in humus, which was previously thought to be the main component. Now. We want to uh, therefore encourage mycorrhizal fungi. I think any plant would agree with that proposition because of, of how important uh, these fungi are to the plant. So in order to uh, make sure that those fungi are happy, minimize the use of manure and synthetic fertilizer. So let's talk about synthetic fertilizer. Uh, it's awfully tempting to see those numbers on a bag, 10, 10, 10 means uh, uh, you know, a lot of nitrogen, a lot of phosphorus, a lot of potassium, and we know that those are elements that, that plants need a lot of. So uh, it, we're tempted to give it to them in the form of uh, f fertilizer from a bag. The only problem is, well, there are a lot of problems as you see down, just glancing down this page, um, everything about this uh, synthetic fertilizer is just wrong. Uh, and it might be a temporary fix, uh, uh, much, much like uh, uh, drugs can be a temporary fix for the addict, but that's, uh, the, the analogy is apt because it's ultimately it's bad for the uh, soil. It kills the microbes. It's toxic to them. It's also manuf the manufacture of synthetic fertilizer is bad for the planet. It, it causes pollution uh, and uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, so, uh, and the other thing that uh, we want to do is minimize digging, especially rototilling. So uh, here's, here's why. Uh, the, uh, apart from doing the damage to the mycorrhizal fungi, rototilling causes compaction due to settling. It causes tiller pan just below where the tines reach. It ruins the soil structure and destroys worm tunnels, consumes soil nutrients because of all that, that uh, is brought to the surface and gets uh, consumed, inverts the soil, displacing bacteria, fungi, and earthworms. And they end up not being where they wanted to be. And as if that's not enough, exposes the weed seeds when you till inviting them to grow because when, when they'll get the stimulation of, of the sunlight and uh, that's their opportunity. So the benefits of no-till gardening include less labor, the soil microbes thrive, conservation of soil organic matter and conservation of moisture. Uh, and here's what you do instead. Uh, if you want to start a garden or indeed if you want to get rid of uh, any vegetation uh, that um, that's not what you desire on your landscape, uh, you just give it a, a, a haircut just really crop it close with the lawnmower and then you smother it with either cardboard or six layers of uh, newspaper, uh, uh, any any uh, 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 organic layer that, that will serve that function. In the right hand corner, you'll see uh, lower right hand corner, you'll see what's called a ram board, a long roll of cardboard uh, if you have a large area to cover. And then uh, it's good to put some compost on that and then some mulch uh, on the top layer. The benefits of mulch as a top layer, it suppresses the weeds, keeps the soil moist and cool, and enriches the soil. And these, uh, for your annual beds, you know, your traditional vegetable beds, uh, grass clippings, straw, shredded leaves, or pine needles, pine straw, uh, are all good options. Uh, it's, it's a myth, by the way, that pine needles will make your soil acidic. That does not happen. Uh, if you're starting perennial beds, those shredded leaves and pine straw are good. And so are, are pine bark, sawdust, wood chips, and chip branch wood. Uh, so here it is, pine straw mulch. What's not to like, right? Perfect level of acidity, breaks down slowly, easy to handle, lightweight, economical, easy to apply, breathes well, doesn't compact, allows for water infiltration, doesn't float and wash away, looks good. So I, it's one of my favorite mulches. Uh, leaf mold improves the soil structure, increases water retention in soils by over 50%, provides fantastic habitat for earthworms and other soil life. 
it takes a while for it to uh, become mold uh, if it's just, just sitting there. But uh, now let's talk about cover crops. Uh, it's not just far farmers who can do cover crops. Uh, we can do it too in our own gardens uh, because cover crops suppress weeds. They build soil fertility and tilth and they prevent leaching of nutrients. So it's a little bit like having um, a layer of mulch, only it's a living layer of mulch uh, in between, uh, you know, when you're not using your garden space actively uh, for growing plants that are uh, you'll be harvesting crops from. So uh, rye is one possibility and you can get the kind that winter kills. Uh, field pea and oats in combination, the peas fix nitrogen, the oats, oats make a lot of organic matter. Um, sorghum, very tall, uh, goes, grows to as, as much as uh, 12 feet tall, uh, large amounts of organic matter. Um, and then uh, buckwheat is a common uh, cover crop, very fast growing, quick canopy to shade the weeds, uh, and also has beneficial uh, flowering flowers for the beneficial insects. And then clover, which fixes nitrogen, and you will inoculate, inoculate with rhizobium bacteria. Let's talk about compost. It feeds beneficial soil life. This this is uh, what a gardener calls black gold. It's a, it's the gardener's friend. It, it, there's almost nothing that it doesn't do for uh, to solve your gardening problems. Increases water retention, improves drought tolerance, makes it gives the soil a good texture, uh, produces humus, buffers the soil pH, and boosts yields. So compost happens when you mix a three or four to one ratio of browns to greens by volume. Uh, or equal amounts by weight. So there are the, the browns on the left, high carbon, uh, uh, so drier, older, or woody plant tissue. Uh, so notice when you're, uh, uh, I, I made the mistake uh, early on in my gardening, I thought that I would just put vegetable and fruit scraps in a bin and they would become compost. Well, they became a stinky mess is what they became uh, because I wasn't balancing them with the browns. So whenever you add uh, vegetable and fruit scraps from your uh, kitchen uh, compost bucket or whatever, uh, you're going to have to add something from that left column to, to uh, uh, an equal amounts by weight. But because um, the uh, they usually take up more space, you, you're, you're going to want three or four times by volume of browns to greens. Uh, here's some things not to add. Uh, uh, I think all these are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, and you might want to test for a toxic herbicide contamination with peas or beans uh, uh, germinating those peas or bean seeds uh, if you use animal manures or straw or hay because there might be uh, herbicide contaminating those uh, uh, ingredients. Now, compost containers, there's a variety of uh, approaches you can take. I like the one uh, right here on the middle on the left uh, where there are two compartments and you can be uh, adding to one and then when you're done adding there you just let you can let it settle and you keep on turning it but then you can start over here uh, so uh, but there, there are a variety of uh, reasons why you might want to do one or the other in, a, in different situations um, a cinder block a multiple bin would work well uh, and uh, so if you're in, in a hurry and you want compost soon well, you keep the pile moist and allow it to reach 131 degrees. It's cooking in there and you keep mixing it uh, five times over two or three um, weeks and then allow it to cure for at least six weeks and then you have finished compost. Or if you turn and add the water every couple of weeks it'll, and let it cure in eight to 14 weeks. Uh, cold composting is when you virtually ignore it and uh, it's still ready to use in six months to a year, even if you never uh, turn it and uh, uh, and if it never reaches that high temperature. You can compost indoors. Uh, uh, Lee Reich in the book Weedless Gardening suggests this method of uh, just putting in your kitchen scraps and then adding a layer of soil uh, and sand in between those layers. Uh, vermicomposting is something else you can do indoors. It's, uh, it's a, a kind of compost that's high quality, nutrient rich. Uh, it, it's amazingly good uh, uh, fertile uh, compost and these uh, these red wriggler worms, which show up in your compost pile, incidentally, uh, oxygen, darkness, and warmth is what they need, uh, and they also need moist um, bedding such as aged straw, fall leaves, or shredded uh, paper of different kinds. Uh, they also, uh, for their food, they need food scraps, and it needs to be partially decomposed. So you can help that along by chopping or blending or freezing the, the food and help it start to decompose and just a handful of soil and you can uh, do uh, plastic vermicomposting under your sink and uh, you see the, the lower bucket uh, is receiving whatever moisture 
uh, it catches from the upper uh, home of those red wrigglers. And it's surprisingly uh, uh, manageable that there's no odor uh, if you're doing things right. Uh, you can also use a dresser drawer uh, or create it or make a dresser drawer if you have the lumber. Now let's talk about soil pH. Uh, a neutral, uh, that is, you know, neither acid nor alkaline, alkaline is 7.0. And the reason pH is important is that when you get to the extremes of either acidic or alkaline, the nutrients are less available to the plant. Uh, you'll, you'll see on the uh, acidic end, as it uh, goes towards five and then four, the, the nitrogen, for example, becomes less and less available to the plant. And as, likewise, as it goes higher into the upper numbers, the alkaline end of the spectrum, uh, it also becomes less available. So you can test your soil pH uh, with one of these kits, uh, uh, it's quite inexpensive, or you can also do a, a, a quick and dirty kind of uh, find out whether it's acidic or basic without having a number attached, but adding uh, baking soda to soil, if it bubbles, uh, then it's acidic. And if you add vinegar and it bubbles, then it's basic. Uh, and this is a, a fun uh, approach to soil pH testing. Simmer some red cabbage leaves for 10 minutes and then uh, add two teaspoons of garden soil to a jar and a few inches of that cabbage water and stir, wait for 20 to 30 minutes and check the color. Uh, so uh, your, your own little uh, chemical laboratory. Uh, here is a list of plants, some of which uh, can do just fine. As you can see, the first three, asparagus, beets, and cabbage, all the way up to 8.0, and that's okay with them. And at the, at the other extreme down up, uh, at the bottom, you'll see potatoes can handle it uh, at, at quite low uh, a, a pH. And you'll also notice that everything, uh, every plant in this list uh, does okay from between 6 and 6.5. So that could be your goal is to make sure your soil is between 6 and 6.5, or you could simply accept what you have and then plant the plants that, uh, uh, that are compatible with that soil pH. So if the soil is too acidic, you can add lime, wood ashes, or compost, because remember, compost buffers soil pH. Uh, so that if the soil is too basic, add sulfur, Epsom salts, or compost. Wood ash is preferable to lime because the, this chart shows that wood ash simply has more of the nutrients that, than lime does. Wood ash, after all, comes from wood, which has those nutrients in it, and lime is more of a, of a chemical additive. So hardwood ash is, is preferable, and uh, you can compost it to leach the lye and salts or, or scatter it lightly. Uh, wood ash also works to repel snails and slugs. Other slug deterrents in, are anything dry, dusty, or scratchy, such as lime, diatomaceous earth, cinders, coarse sawdust, gravel, and sand. Uh, soil texture is another concern or uh, something to pay attention to. Uh, loam is this sweet spot right here in the lower middle of the of the uh, triangle, the texture triangle. So we don't want too much clay in our soil, more than 40%, and it becomes quite problematic because um, the soil just can't breathe. This, the clay particles are so tiny, and it just and it becomes uh, caked very easily in the absence of rain. Uh, but we don't want extremes of of any kind. We, we wouldn't want all uh, all sand because uh, it needs there, the clay actually has some benefits in moderate amounts, the way it holds on to soil nutrients. So um, you can test for soil texture by digging a sample of soil, uh, removing, removing stones, roots, mulch, and other chunks of organic matter, and then put about two inches of soil in a quart jar, add either dishwater, de washer detergent, Lorax or Calgon, uh, uh, fill it with water to two inches of it to the top, shake for five minutes, and then leave it. It might take a while, like a matter of a week or two, uh, for that um, top layer for the clay to settle. But then once it does, you'll be able to measure the relative amounts of clay, silt, and sand, and hopefully you have something near it alone. Um, and uh, so you can also test for soil texture simply by moistening and then rolling a ball of soil. It's called a bolus. And then you squeeze it between your thumb and forefinger to form a ribbon. And if it makes a long ribbon, you have clay soil. If it makes a very short ribbon, you have sandy soil. And here is the, the loam would be that sweet spot right in the middle, uh, the just right. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, uh, that, that demonstrates that you have some cl sand and clay, which is good, but not too much. Soil compaction is the largest, it is the most uh, limiting uh, factor in landscape in soil uh, 
uh, in soils and landscaping situations. And you see in this diagram, the problem is if it's compacted, that it just won't allow moisture or air uh, and roots need both of those. Um, so you can test for soil compaction by digging a, a cubic foot hole and fill it up with water and wait for it to infiltrate through the soil, fill it again two hours later. And if that takes over 45 minutes to infiltrate again, uh, and you don't have a very clay soil to, begin, soil to begin with, you likely have a soil compaction problem. Um, water should drain through a very perforated coffee can faster than one half to one inch per hour. You could also just uh, stick a straightened wire hanger into the soil. And if it uh, bends uh, to a depth of 12 inches, uh, well, then you have compacted soil. But if, it, if you can move it without bending, that indicates good porosity. Daikon radish is, a, is an edible vegetable, very uh, long, much longer than a carrot, uh, and uh, it has the advantage, not only does it alleviate compaction because it's drilling holes in the soil for you, but it also suppresses weeds, provides soil cover, and scavenges nutrients into the bargain. Uh, here's a mechanical way of uh, putting holes in the soil and, and loosening up using a broad fork. Uh, and sometimes uh, earthworms can do this job. Now, you might want to do an earthworm census, uh, dig and remove one square foot of garden soil, seven inches deep, and then count the worms, all sizes of, of doesn't matter if they're small or large. And if you have 10 or more worms, you ha have a healthy soil. It's well-drained, plenty of organic matter, and a pH that's right there where you want it between six and seven. Um, now, uh, let's see, I think I showed this. Uh, comfrey for fertility. Uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, again, are those uh, nutrients that plants need the most of. Comfrey leaves have a 1.8, 0.5, 5.3 profile and contain other uh, uh, micronutrients as well. Compare that to these different kinds of manure, and you can see that comfrey leaves has more nitrogen than any manure except for rabbit manure, more phosphorus than any except for uh, except chicken and rabbit, and way more potassium than any of these manures. So. Uh, there you have it. Uh, comfrey is a plant that you can establish uh, as a, it's a perennial uh, and you can do a chop and drop technique. And if you, if you harvest those comfrey leaves uh, from the base of established plants, uh, you might want to wear gloves because they, that those leaves can irritate the skin. Uh, chop them up, pack them tightly into a watertight container, check on the progress every few weeks. Of course, it's going to stink because that was, that's what happens when you put uh, any organic matter in water and let it sit. But if you dilute it uh, at a rate of one part to 10 parts water, uh, you can use it as a potassium rich liquid fertilizer to encourage flowers and fruit set. So who needs synthetic fertilizer, right? And here's another way to get um, an organic fertilizer, stinging nettle. Uh, again, uh, wear gloves when you handle this. Uh, it, it will definitely sting you. Uh, but it's an excellent side dressing and foliar spray. It's a source of nitrogen, iron, magnesium, and sulfur. So to make nettle tea, it's very sim similar to making comfrey tea. Just uh, you know, cut up the leaves, uh, add water to the top, set it in a warm, sunny place, stir every day or uh, every few days, and it's ready to use in two weeks. Again, diluted one to 10. Uh, Interestingly, if you look closely enough at leaves, if you have a microscope, you're going to see these stomata, which are like lips that open and close. And on a, on a dry day uh, and a hot day, uh, those lips will be, those stomata will be closed shut because the leaf doesn't want to wilt and lose whatever moisture is inside. But on a moist day, uh, when it's high humidity or when, when it's raining, uh, those stomata open up and they are able to drink literally whatever is on the surface uh, that might be beneficial to them. Therefore, uh, foliar sprays are the most direct way to fertilize a plant. Uh, after all, when you uh, pour a fertilizer in the soil, uh, the roots can only get some of it. They won't get uh, nearly all of it. Uh, but when you spray the, the, uh, anything on leaves, it's like a, a direct uh, connection to uh, you know, the, those stomata can uh, little, literally drink whatever you've got on the, on the uh, sur surface of the leaf. So, uh, you can use any weeds, but the rich weeds that we met, ment mentioned, uh, comfrey nettle and thistle is another one, are, are preferable. Uh, Henry Doubleday Skipper Tea, just kitchen waste itself in gallon, in 10 gallons of water. Or how about compost in uh, with two parts water by volume. And manure also can be uh, made into a manure tea. Uh, and perhaps best of all, uh, seaweed meal and uh, fish meal. There, the, there's something about those products from the sea which are rich in micro, micronutrients, hormones, and amino acids that stimulate cell division and provide some resistance against marginal frosts. 
So here's some ideas for foliar spray uh, recipes and application. I'm not going to read all this to you. I'm just uh, pointing out that there are some uh, details that you might be able to um, glean if you go to the internet and uh, learn more about uh, how to apply and how to use foliar sprays. Uh, Epsom salts is a, a, a great way to uh, can can often help help uh, the with the uh, uh, yield and the size and appearance and even the taste of uh, tomatoes and peppers. And it also is beneficial to roses, azaleas, and rhododendrons. Uh, Epsom salts is magnesium sulfate, and that magnesium uh, it, uh, tomatoes and peppers happen to be heavy feeders of magnesium, but also magnesium improves the absorption of nitrogen and phosphorus, which are such essential nutrients. Uh, so, uh, and, and uh, lowering the pH, if you have a, a, a fairly you know, basic soil, is another um, uh, uh, benefit. Uh, so uh, you can either sprinkle the salt granules into the hole when you're transplanting, or you can make a foliar spray uh, and uh, spray when the blooms first appear, or you can irrigate with Epsom salt solution around the base of the plant. So those are three different ways and you could use all three. Uh, speaking of irrigation, drip irrigation is a wonderful system. It does require an upfront investment, uh, but you might be glad that you did it because all these benefits, uh, delivering water directly to the root zone, it's very efficient. Uh, it'll seep slowly into the soil one drop at a time. Uh, so it reduces runoff and evaporation and the soil particles absorb and hold the water for the plants and very few nutrients are leached from the soil. So there's less water wasted on weeds, it saves both time and effort, and you would flush the system and store it for the winter. Uh, there's also, a, you can also uh, attach a timer uh, to the um, drip irrigation system. So you can turn it off uh, right when, uh, you know, you, you'll, you'll know how long it takes to do the job uh, and uh, it'll just automatically turn itself off. Soaker hoses can also uh, have timers attached to them. They're cheaper than drip ir irrigation, but they don't work well on slopes. They only work in lengths of up to 200 feet, and some are made of recycled rubber and may not be good for food crops. And here's the approach to doing soaker hoses, holding them in place with wire pins, use, uh, covering them with mulch, uh, leave it running until the water has penetrated six to 12 inches, and then you can automate by adding a timer. This is a nice gadget, this hose extension wad to aim and deliver water exactly to where you want, uh, you know, to, to the plants and not the weeds. Uh, you can even uh, bury a clay pot next to a, a plant that you don't want to uh, suffer. When, let's say you're going on vacation and you'll be away for a few weeks. You want to make sure that plant gets watered, uh, even, even if there's a drought. Well, if, uh, if there's a buried clay pot filled with water and then you uh, put some lid on top so no animals uh, fall in uh, and, and so that it doesn't uh, dry out too soon. Uh, that water from the clay pot will just uh, 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 migrate into the soil and, and provide a steady supply of, of water for that plant. You can measure the moisture. and This is a handy uh, uh, approach. It's, it's nice to know, uh, especially if you have containers and this can be used either, these can be used either for indoor or outdoor containers or yeah, you can measure the soil itself. Um, there's a three-way meter in which you measure the light and the pH as well as the moisture. Now, when you're selecting a site, uh, six plus hours a day is optimal. Some plants want more than that, but uh, at least six hours is good. Uh, terrain, uh, fill in or avoid standing water. Uh, optimal orientation to the sun would be a, a south facing slope or a west facing slope. Uh, those would be preferable to the uh, east or north, but it, it all depends on how steep the slope is and whether it makes it much of a difference. Um, and then you you might want to have the, your soil tested for the soil type, the pH, nutrients, and drainage. Uh, you, you want an open area that has some air circulation, but you don't want it too open. Wind breaks and trellises might help to protect from the wind. Uh, and you want your garden to be near your dwelling and your source of water and your source of compost. And this is kind of key also to the idea of whether you have a green thumb, because if you have your garden uh, near uh, and you'll be walking by it every day, uh, you, you, you can't help but notice things. And noticing, notice, noticing things is key to your success as a gardener, because then you'll uh, take the appropriate uh, action. Uh, you want to avoid human and animal impact, so you don't want to have your gardens to be right in, in the path of where humans and animals would be walking. So um, shade tolerant plants will tolerate three to six hours of sun per day or a constant dappled shade. 
And these are usually plants that are grown for their stems, leaves, or buds, not uh, plants grown for the roots or fruits that tend to need more sun. So here is a list of shade tolerant plants. The ones with an asterisk will give you smaller yields than normal, but they're still worth growing even if you have, uh, you know, if, if that's the best you can do, having a shade would uh, tolerant, uh, a shade, shady situation would be okay for those plants. And the other plants, uh, you wouldn't even notice uh, uh, a decrease in yield that's significant. In fact, there are some plants that actually prefer partial shade. You don't want your soil, uh, you don't want your garden to be near uh, a tree and uh, even beyond the drip line, as you can see the diagram in this tree, the, the roots go beyond the drip line. Uh, they don't go down so much as they go out because that is where the uh, available water and nutrients are and the tree's roots uh, are, uh, are seeking those nutrients. So uh, if you had your, uh, even if your tree was not, the tree was not shading your garden bed, if it's too close to that tree, you're going to have uh, competition from the tree roots uh, and that's not desirable. Uh, there are also some trees such as this black walnut, also um, Norway maple and sycamore maple and tree of heaven are all allelopathic, which means that the tree roots actually secrete uh, substances that inhibit the growth of, of a plant uh, of the roots of other plants, such as tomatoes. And, uh, you know, they don't necessarily inhibit every plant, but uh, it's good. It's good to be aware of this. So if you want to make the most of limited space, here are some ideas. Use transplants and get an early start. Uh, grow productive space efficient extended harvest crops and here they are. Um, grow several plantings of short season crops and here they are. Uh, grow compact crops that don't take up much space such as scallions and carrots. Specialty crops make sense because uh, well why, you don't need to grow uh, things that that's easy to get in the grocery store and that you can get fairly inexpensively. Uh, grow vertical with trellises so, because that uh, gives you more growing space. Uh, cut and come again salad greens is another approach to make the most of limited space and also uh, don't forget to remove plants that you're no, no longer harvesting from to make room for new plantings. Uh, stagger the plants and, and interplant different crops in the same bed uh, and so let's look at examples. Your typical row garden and often the, on the package of, of, on the seed package it'll say well plant your uh, seeds six inches apart and the rows three feet apart so if you're uh, doing following those instructions this is what your typical row garden is going to look like but look at all this wasted space in those rows it, it makes a lot more sense to have a bed such as uh, mm -hmm. this where it's uh, uh, where the plants are still six inches six inches apart but they're they're uh, in rows um, and there's no uh, uh, everything's equidistant uh, so you have a lot more yield in, with a garden like that um, I'd, I'd like to uh, Put, a good, put in a good word for this fellow, um, uh, Edward C. Smith, and uh, he his word is W-O-R-D, wide rows, organic methods, raised beds, and deep soil. So there's the, we just talked about wide rows, where, and this whole presentation is about organic methods. Uh, he likes raised beds and deep soil, and you can understand how those two go together. That means a lot of fertile soil for, the, uh, for those roots to grow in. So, uh, uh, let's continue thinking about limited space. Uh, instead of having the, the rows and columns nice and neat as in the previous illustration, if they're staggered like this, you could fit even more plants uh, in a given area. And interplanting uh, was also mentioned. So let's imagine that those three plants in the center are tomato plants and they're going to get to be pretty big, but it takes a while for them to get big. So in the meantime, while we're waiting for those to grow, go ahead and plant some smaller, faster growing plants around them. There's still plenty of light uh, until the tomato plant starts to uh, shade them out. And there's still enough light for them to grow and give you a harvest. And so some examples of interplanting uh, between these larger, slower growing vegetables, not only tomatoes, but these others on the list here, uh, you could put these smaller, fast maturing vegetables around them. Lettuce, mesclun, spinach, beets, kale, Swiss chard, and radish. Um, so examples of uh, pairing of vegetables would be spinach and tomatoes. The spinach matures before the tomatoes grow enough to shade it. Or onions and cabbage. The onions mature before the cabbages crowd them out. Cabbages will shade the onion bulbs, keeping the soil cool and moist. And uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the three sisters approach. Uh, the squash um, shading the soil and keeping it weed-free, and then the corn rising above it, and then the, the uh, 
uh, beans, which may not be in the illustration, but uh, you can picture the bean, the, the pole beans uh, running up, twining up the, uh, the corn stalks. Incidentally, um, those uh, squash leaves uh, can repel raccoons because raccoons don't like the feeling of the rough leaves on their feet. Uh, so here is a, a, a handy chart that shows when you can plant uh, and, and uh, different seeds or different plants and put them in soil, and also uh, how long you can expect uh, 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 it, to, it to take for them for that crop uh, to be harvested. Uh, so. Uh, it's it's handy to have something like this so so that when for example you have some kale uh, and you you look at the um, uh, when you're harvesting it well once you once you do take that out of the ground what can you plant uh, cabbage cauliflower uh, carrots cucumbers corn and beans are are all possibilities to, after that kale has been harvested so create a planting schedule by drawing a spring summer and fall diagram from each bed uh, and uh, here's some plants if you can. Uh, plant now, and and if your uh, garden bed is not too uh, wet, you don't want to cause compaction by going into your garden too soon, uh, which would happen if it's muddy and you'll just, you'll kind of uh, you'll be compacting the soil with with the weight of your. Uh, uh, but but if you're uh, able to, uh, if you have a raised bed, or if you don't actually, uh, if you're not actually walking in the bed, um, it's not too early to plant peas, radish, lettuce, spinach, carrots, and beets from seed. Uh, plant in the summer for fall harvest. Uh, some of these uh, crops, such as carrots and kale, taste better after they have endured some cold weather. And you might want to keep a journal to record what you do when and use it as a guide in future years. Uh, so spring and fall plantings, here are, here are the spring plantings, super hardy crops, uh, as soon as the ground is suitable. You, you can plant these. Hardy crops planting two to four weeks before last expected frost, lettuce, coriander, uh, mustard, and radish. Uh, average crops one to two weeks before last frost are, include the beet, carrot, parsnip, broccoli, cabbage, kale, chard, and potato. Uh, tender crops right around the last frost. Uh, wait until then before you put those beans, corn, and squash seeds in. And then wait two weeks after the last frost for the heat-loving crops. Now, uh, fall plantings are another uh, option. Four months before the first frost, the leeks can go in. Three months before, beet, carrot, Chinese cabbage, rutabaga. Two months before, Chinese mustards, lettuce, peas, spinach, and turnip. And so in fall, for an early spring crop, lettuce, spinach, and parsley. So you, the spring is certainly not the only time to plant. Uh, and if you want to push the season a little bit, you can make yourself some of these milk container hot caps. And you can see how, uh, if, if it's expected that the night is going to be uh, frosty and cold, just giving them uh, some protection and then uh, uh, removing them uh, after it's uh, warm enough again. Raised garden beds have many advantages, as you can see. Um, and uh, I, one of the main uh, advantages is, that, is the quality control of the soil. You're filling that, those beds with what you want, uh, and, and you won't have to uh, worry about rocks, and you won't have to worry about any toxins. Uh, there's no drainage and compaction problems. You can control the watering. It looks good. Uh, the only disadvantages that I can think of that, that is that it can dry out a little bit faster. It might need a little bit more watering than if uh, it was a non-raised bed. And if you've changed your mind about where you want those beds to be, it's going to be hard to move. Uh, here's some approaches. Uh, the up, upper left, that's called wattle. Uh, you can use logs if you have them. Uh, cinder blocks work, uh, although uh, eventually in, this, in our uh, climate, they will weather and crack with the uh, uh, alternate freezing and then uh, uh, heat in the summer. And then the the, uh, the boards, uh, you can do a raised bed construction. Uh, pine wood will uh, uh, only last a few years. Uh, cedar will last uh, several years more. So uh, it's rot resistant. Uh, and, uh, and then there's galvanized raised beds, uh, and they can be uh, just about any height that you choose. There's different uh, uh, examples of this on the market. The ultimate raised bed. If you want to uh, create something like this, you need, uh, you know, the uh, the milk crates, uh, milk carton crates, uh, and they're uh, stacked uh, so there are two of them too high. Uh, and uh, on top of that, you put the hardware cloth uh, and uh, landscape fabric, and then the soil. So the soil is not going all the way to the bottom of this raised bed. Uh, and it's an interesting uh, 
kind of raised bed here. This is called Hugo culture or hill culture. Uh, and it, you can either uh, dig a, a, a trough or uh, or just lay them out on the on the ground as uh, whichever you see fit. But if you have old logs or branches and then cover them with organic matter, you have a raised bed. And an, uh, an advantage of this is that the uh, the decomposing wood uh, will uh, heat the bed for you. Uh, poison ivy is something to be aware of. If any gardener needs to be able to identify it, those the leaves of three. Um, and uh, jewelweed is an uh, herb that's uh, it's a wild uh, plant that grows in moist places. And if you crush the leaves, it, it will relieve the itch of jewelweed. Or if you, uh, if you know you've been exposed to poison ivy, you crush the leaves and, and put it on that spot of your skin, uh, and uh, you probably won't get the, the rash. Uh, so now let's talk about crop rotation. Uh, your, uh, it prevents the buildup of soil-borne pests and diseases and allows for the replenishment and efficient use of soil nutrients if you don't always grow the same things in the same place. So uh, examples of heavy feeders, uh, leaf and root crop, fruit crops, uh, come from the uh, cabbage family, the lettuce family, the beet family, the tomato family, and the squash family. Examples of light feeders would be the onion family, carrot family, and uh, the, uh, the root crops and legumes enrich the soil, which, which is the, especially the bean family, which is uh, the family where there's nitrogen fixing is happening. So here's the diagram that you can use. And uh, you'll see uh, in this, it's a four year rotation. So you'll see the beans, peas, lima beans, and potatoes would all be the first year. Uh, and they are enriching the soil. So uh, once that soil is enriched, then the next year you can use those, um, you can plant the, the crops that you're harvesting for their leaves, which are hungry for the nitrogen that has been added by the uh, nitrogen, fixing, nitrogen fixing plants. And then in the third year in that same plot, you would go with the fruits, which aren't, so, aren't quite as hungry for the nitrogen. They need it, of course, but they're, they're looking more for the phosphorus. Tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, eggplants, squash, and melons. Then finally, uh, in the fourth year, the root crops, uh, which uh, are the, uh, uh, they, they can manage uh, whatever's left over, basically, uh, in terms of soil nutrients. Of course, it always helps to add uh, compost if you can, or other fer uh, organic fertilizer. And then at the end, uh, at the fourth year, you would go, uh, uh, after those four years, then you would, the fifth year, you would once again plant the uh, nitrogen fixing beans, peas, uh, and potatoes can also go in that uh, in that combination well. So uh, let's talk about peas. There are a lot of choices. Uh, you could have green or English peas, which are uh, 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 which are different from the snow or snap peas, right? So uh, vining or dwarf are are the two options. Uh, extra early, early or mid season, wrinkle seeded or smooth seeded. The wrinkled peas are sweeter. The smooth ones are hardier for early spring planting and fall harvests. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to read all this information to you. Uh, I am going to give you an, uh, the opportunity to, uh, if you if you'd like to um, uh, send an email message to me, I can give you whichever uh, uh, information you need more details about. Uh, and I'll provide you with my email address at the end of the program. But uh, it's, it's relevant here to look to be aware that pea plants can survive frosts and you can go ahead and put peas in the ground now, but those plants won't tolerate temperatures over 75 degrees. And this is a plant that you can interplant with other plants for, uh, uh, but not near garlic or onions. Um, so uh, it can be handy uh, to pre-germinate pea seeds and corn seeds, for, for example. So the large seeds like peas and beans and corn, um, all those seeds need for germination is, is a moist uh, paper towel or, 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 um, or a rag or something. Uh, and they will respond to that moisture by germinating. Uh, if you uh, if you keep them moist, and the, the advantage to that is uh, first, if uh, well, if there are some seeds that aren't germinating, you, you'll just ignore them, and you'll go with the ones that look healthy. Uh, so when you uh, are ready to put them out in your garden, you can space them exactly where you want to. Uh, you can also uh, put the roots uh, facing down. Uh, and and you can time your plantings so that uh, if there's if there's rain in the forecast, you can get out there, put them in the ground, and let the rain uh, irrigate them for you. Uh, think about beans being either uh, shell or snap, and scarlet runner beans on the right of this slide 
can be either one. So you can eat them uh, as uh, uh, shell beans, uh, uh, or you know, or you can actually harvest the, the beans later on when the pods are mature and uh, and cook those beans. Uh, choose a sunny, well-drained area, rich in organic matter. You can dust with the inoculant uh, a week or two after last expected frost. Um, so the bush beans uh, sowed, uh, and, and you can stagger plantings at two week intervals until two months before the first frost for a continuous harvest. But the pole beans, if you put them in uh, at the right time, um, when it's when the soil is warmed up enough, and they will keep on hard, uh, keep on yielding for you. They'll keep on producing uh, until they're, for the frost finally kills them. So uh, all they need is a some kind of vertical support, uh, and they'll keep going. Uh, so on with the next group. Uh, we've talked about the legumes. Now here are the leafy crops and lettuce and mesquin are examples. Uh, and you can interplant them with the taller vegetables. Uh, they need a humus rich, moisture retentive, well drained soil. Uh, you can broadcast the seeds and rake lightly to cover them or sow them a quarter inches apart. Um, and uh, and again, at two week intervals, if you like, uh, if you want uh, successive uh, harvests. Uh, in the midsummer, you can switch to head or romaine types, making successive sowings in shady areas for a fall harvest. Spinach grow in moist nitrogen rich soil, buy fresh seeds every year. Uh, sow the seeds a half inch deep and two inches apart as soon as you can work the soil. Uh, make successive plantings every 10 days until mid-May. Thin the seedlings four to six inches apart when plants have two true leaves. Fertilize with compost tea when late plants have four true leaves if you have it. Uh, spread light mulch to suppress the weeds. And when you harvest, cut the outside leaves that have at least six leaves, three inches to four inches long. Harvest the entire crop at the first sign of those plants bolting, which means the flower stalk is start, starting to uh, head skyward. Okay, here are some wonderful Asian greens. I love the, the taste of these. They, uh, they grow well in cool weather. You would plant in the early spring and, and also again in the fall. They could be planted thickly. They could be harvested with scissors. Uh, edible at any stage of growth, that's a great uh, advantage, including the flowering shoots are edible. Uh, we're all familiar with broccoli. Uh, it prefers full sun, but partial shade can prevent plants from bolting and is a, uh, you'll get some harvest. Uh, you can choose a fast maturing variety for a spring crop. Uh, you want a rich well-drained soil, plenty of compost, uh, 18 inch spacing, top dress with compost tea, uh, two to three weeks after transplanting and repeat monthly. Uh, cultivate around the young young plants to to uh, manage weeds. Uh, a thick down a thick layer of organic mulch is helpful when temperatures exceed 75 degrees, keeping that soil moist and cool. Um, and then you you can keep setting, cutting those side shoots to give you more broccoli until the weather turns too hot or too cold. Now planting pato potatoes, uh, uh, there are varieties of approaches to this. You'll see in the lower left, uh, it's possible to plant them in bags, or in the lower right. Uh, in a, a garbage can. Uh, the idea is that uh, you put those potato eyes in the soil at the bottom, and then as they grow, you just put more soil in, and that forces the stem to become more roots. And so that you keep on going like that, and you'll have the entire bag or the entire garbage can uh, filled with the potatoes. And if you're doing it out uh, in your garden bed, uh, you, you start them in these troughs here, and then uh, keep on adding more and more soil uh, as those plants grow uh, and uh, you have the same effect. So you want uh, certified disease-free seed potatoes from garden centers of the internet uh, and they need space, sunshine and fertile well-drained soil. Uh, their uh, acid is, is actually, they're, they're the most acid tolerant uh, vegetable in, in that chart that I uh, showed earlier. Um, so, uh, cut uh, plant early cultivars two to three weeks before the last spring frost. Uh, as the vines grow, the hill of the soil leaves straw or compost over them to keep the developing tubers covered. Once they blossom though, stop filling up the soil and apply a thick mulch to conserve moisture and keep down weeds. Water deeply during dry spells. Uh, corn, plant the seeds after all danger frost has passed and the soil warms up to 60 degrees. Plant in blocks rather than rows to promote pollination. This is very important because uh, you know it, it's uh, that uh, you're not going to get very good uh, 
yields unless you have the, the uh, wind, it's, it's, it's wind pollinated and then those ears need to receive that pollen. Uh, it's also a much more efficient use of space to plant in blocks rather than rows. And you can plant early, mid-season and late types if you want extended harvest. Um, and uh, you can mulch or interplant with squash as I showed earlier to prevent weed growth. Uh, fertilize when the plants are six inches tall and again when they're knee high. Keep them watered and harvest about three weeks after the corn silks appear. Uh, consider these um, heritage and, and heirloom seeds. For example, Seed Savers Exchange will uh, give you a good sampling uh, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of choices. Uh, and uh, they're, I think they're quite reasonable prices and they're uh, my own taste. I, I really like the, the taste of the, uh, the old fashioned varieties. All right, now we're on to the next uh, fruit section, the tomatoes, cucumbers, etc. And let's talk about tomatoes. So you'll see in the illustration here that uh, the transplanted tomato has been laid in the ground at an angle uh, so that uh, all of that uh, stem uh, is buried and that stem will all become uh, root. There will, roots will sprout from that stem and, and that will give, give the plant more uh, root surface area to uh, um, feed on uh, on the on you know to receive whatever soil moisture and nutrients there are uh, interestingly this is one of those plants where you can you can put uncomposted kitchen scraps in that hole with the tomatoes and also don't forget about the epsom salts you could sprinkle some of that, those epsom salts in that hole uh, when you're putting that that tomato plant in uh, the reason that uh, you don't want to uh, dig a hole and and plant the tomato straight down vertically is that uh, you don't want it too deep where there, uh, you want it closer to the soil surface where there's more nutrients and, and more water. Uh, so uh, 10 plus hours of sun is good if possible. Uh, and you don't want to keep on growing those tomatoes in the same spot every year. That's what that's part of what crop rotation is about. Uh, because if, if you do, the diseases will be waiting right there in the soil to attack uh, whatever disease, disease there might have been left over from the last year. Uh, avoid overgrown transplants with fruits or lush green foliage. This is interesting. They might look tempting, but uh, it would be bad timing uh, to put those plants in the ground the way that they are. Uh, bury the stems up to the first true leaves, as, as I showed in this uh, diagram. Uh, water deeply but infrequently every five to seven days. Pinch the suckers that you see in this uh, upper right here. This is a sucker in the axles between the, the leaf stems and the main stem. Uh, if you pinch, pinch those, then it, would, it, uh, it won't become too bushy. Uh, and uh, the foliage growing there is not likely to support uh, a, a flowers and fruits. So you want all the energy of the plant going to a growth that's going to do that. And you want to provide six foot supports, stakes of some kind or cages. Uh, you want to add the compost and trim the upper leaves while the first fruit is ripening. Plant again three weeks later, so all of your harvest doesn't come at once. Pick them ripe, but not dead ripe. Best companions for tomatoes. Basil, three plants per tomato. It repels insect pests, improves pollination. It's good for the health of plants and improves the flavor. Uh, borage also improves the health and flavor of tomatoes and repels insect pests. And, uh, for the, and uh, borage leaves are also edible. Uh, carrot roots can break up the soil around tomatoes for nutrients, air, and water. Uh, and they're ready to be harvested soon after tomatoes go in the ground. So they're a good companion plant. Uh, spinach and lettuce are in the category of just the smaller plants that can be harvested soon after tomatoes are planted. And then there are some more plants that repel insect pests uh, for uh, and help out the tomatoes. Chives, garlic, marigolds, mints, nasturtiums, and parsley. The worst companions for tomatoes are the ones in the brassica family, which inhibit the tomato growth. Uh, a fennel also inhibits tomato growth and potato increases some susceptibility to this uh, early and late light fungus and the corn attracts the tomato fruit worm, which is also called the corn earworm, which is illustrated here in the lower right of the slide. You can save your own tomato seeds simply by scooping the seeds out of the tomato, putting them in a jar uh, and covering it with uh, 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 a, you know, a piece of plastic or something. And then you're going to have uh, mold develop in, inevitably, which is what you want to happen, because that means that the the, uh, the sticky stuff that uh, surrounds those seeds is then going to uh, be uh, is going to be broken down in that process, 
and the seeds will, uh, you can just take the seeds out and spread them out, let them dry. Uh, you can also, uh, uh, if you if you want to plan ahead, you could have a strip of newspaper and put the seeds in exactly the spacing that you want so that when you're growing them uh, in uh, in the early spring, uh, all you have to do is bury those that, oh, and then you would uh, roll up that strip of newspaper. So it would be ready to go, just unroll it and then uh, put it in your uh, tray when you're uh, doing your planting in the spring uh, to grow those transplants. Eggplants uh, are in the same family. They need steadily warm growing conditions for at least three months. Uh, consider growing them in raised beds. Um, so uh, again, you're gonna wanna keep uh, tabs on, on watering them and make sure they're well uh, fertilized. Mulch immediately after transplanting, weed them. Uh, and uh, the plants need uh, one to one and a half inches of water a week, whether it's provided by rainwater or you. Uh, peppers, choose a sunny, well-drained site. Plant where taller plants will shade peppers in the summer. Uh, however, temperatures over 90 degrees can wilt the plants and cause blossoms to drop. Uh, so choose transplants with strong stems, dark green leaves, and no fruit or start from seed. But if you start from seed, it takes a long time, be forewarned. Uh, before those plants finally germinate um, and space those transplants about uh, uh, one and a half feet apart in rows at least two feet apart. Protect them in, in chilly weather and keep evenly moist and weed gently. For melons, they need the sunniest spot possible with plenty of air circulation, a lot of compost, uh, and you'll plant them in hills four to six feet apart. Uh, watermelons may require more. Uh, some bush types need only two feet though. And you can grow on trellis uh, because these melons are vines after all uh, to preserve space if you like. Uh, sowing six seeds per hill, uh, no earlier than two weeks after the last, fr last frost date, then thin to two or three plants per hill. And you can use the hot caps uh, to keep those seedlings warm when necessary. Uh, and remove the flowers and smaller fruits from the vines after midsummer. The reason for that is that they are not going to have enough time to give you fruit. So you might as well remove the flowers and smaller fruits so that they won't um, drain energy from the plant and you want the, the plant's energy to be going to the fruits that have already begun maturing. And the same principle is true for squash and pumpkins. Uh, you'll see note near the bottom of this slide, uh, pinch off the growing tips when the vines grow to five feet to encourage fruit bearing side shoots and remove all remaining flowers in midsummer. Cucumbers are a vine as well, and uh, it's good to remember that. So, uh, yeah, and they can be used for shading plants that might require a shade uh, in the in the heat. So, uh, uh, but they themselves might need some for some protection. Uh, plant taller crops at the southern end or add a shade cloth to to block forty to fifty percent of the sunlight during a hot spell. So on we go to the uh, root. Uh, part of the uh, rotation. The turnips thrive in well-drained, deeply work worked soil in the full sun. Plant seeds three weeks before the last frost in spring. Plant again in midsummer, about two months before the first frost. Fall crops of turnips are often sweeter and provide a longer harvest period than spring plantings. Uh, so you broadcast the seeds uh, a quarter inch deep uh, and uh, for, for in, the, in the spring, but uh, even deeper for fall crops and you would thin them to three to four inches apart or plant in rows spaced 12 to 18 inches apart. And when the plants are about five inches tall, apply at least two inches of mulch. No extra fertilizer is necessary in well-prepared soil. Beets are relatives of Swiss chard and beet greens are delicious. I love them, uh, both those, the roots and the greens. Uh, plant in full sun and rich well-drained soil work to eight inches. Uh, so, uh, Thin seedlings to leave four inches of space between plants. Uh, so every two weeks until temperatures reach 75 degrees. So uh, begin sowing again eight weeks before the first expected frost for a delicious fall harvest. If you like beets, there you go. Uh, keep the soil moist, mulch, and you can store beets for three to four months at near freezing temperatures with high humidity. Uh, radishes are a very quickly maturing uh, uh, at least these uh, little little red guys that we're familiar with uh, in as little as three weeks. 
uh, so lightly along ro uh, up, up along rows of slow germinators such as carrots and parsnips near spinach or amid hills of cucumbers and squash to repel the cucumber beetles. It will, so they'll be helping out there. Uh, so every week, as soon as you can work the soil uh, until early summer, so again in late summer. So winter radishes in midsummer for a fall harvest. Carrots, there are different kinds. There are the blocky ball type carrots that can handle heavy or shallow soil, while the slender carrots need deep, loose soil. Scatter the seeds in rows about six seeds per inch, uh, three weeks before the last expected frost, and every two to three weeks until two to three months before the first expected fall frost. So and you will need to thin when the plants are four inches tall to a thumb's width apart, thin again a month later to one and a half inches to two inches apart. And you can save and savor those baby carrots when you're thinning them. Just pull them up and bring them in your kitchen. Uh, and the uh, uh, even the foliage is edible. You can use it as a seasoning. Uh, to store indoors, twist off the tops, remove the excess soil, but don't wash, and layer, leaving spaces between carrots in boxes in damp sand topped with straw. To store in, store in the garden, mulch with several inches of dry leaves or straw. Now, if you have plants such as carrots that are have small seeds, the way to pre-germinate them, instead of putting them uh, in um, a moist paper towel, uh, as I described with the uh, corn and pea and bean seeds, uh, these smaller seeds, you, what, you, what you do is mix a cup of water and one tablespoon of corn starch, and then heat and stir until the mixture thickens, pour that into a flat pan, let it set, sprinkle the seeds on top, cover that with a plastic wrap, and then scoop out the seeds with a spoon as soon as they germinate. Uh, and then you can plant them right in holes, or what you can do is take the uh, entire uh, contents of that uh, and put it uh, pour it into an envelope uh, that you've cut a corner out of so that when you you can squeeze the, the mixture of uh, uh, the, the cornstarch and the, the seed the germinated seeds through that corner in the envelope uh, right into the furrow that you've prepared. Parsnips, one of my favorite root vegetables, uh, loosen the soil to a depth of two feet and remove the rocks. Use fresh seed and soak overnight before planting those seeds. Uh, sow them as soon as soil can be worked. Keep moist, thin to three inches apart when plants are six inches tall. Side dressed with compost, they taste sweeter after the frost and can be left in the ground all winter. Onions and garlic grow from transplant sets or seeds. Plant in spring, onions like cool weather. Uh, keep well weeded using a sharp hoe. Um, Mulch once the soil has warmed to suppress weeds and hold soil moisture. Water when necessary. Garlic cloves are planted in the fall in holes or furrows with the flat or root end down. In other words, the point end, pointed end up. And with the tips two inches beneath the soil, six to eight inches apart. Top the soil with six inches of mulch and leave in place through the winter. And then there's some uh, perennial uh, onions. Uh, these uh, white multiplier onions, yellow potato onion, Dutch shallot are examples of perennial onions. There's, there's this unusual uh, walking onion also called Egyptian onion, uh, which will bend over and plant itself. Uh, and this Welsh or spring onion, uh, great for pollinators, by the way, very attractive to bees. Uh, but uh, the, entire, uh, the entire plant, except for the roots, is edible. And I, I think they're, gor they're gorgeous plants. They have really thick leaves. Uh, kind of cylindrical shaped. Uh, chives are quite familiar and they're attractive. Uh, Chinese chives or garlic chives are another option. Every part, uh, you know, it's a very versatile vegetable and it, it really also, it, it does a good job of commanding the space and not allowing any weeds to grow. My favorite onion of all is this wild leek or ramps. And you, you if you uh, obtain the, uh, the, uh, if they've been sustainably harvested, uh, and you can plant your own uh, wild leeks, and uh, uh, it, they're absolutely delicious. They don't look like uh, onions at all. The leaves look more like a lily of the valley, but uh, one uh, one whiff of the leaves, and you realize this is an onion. Uh, it, now, if you'd like to grow strawberries, uh, you, you need to take some time to pre prepare a weed-free site. It might take as much as, much as a year to do that, uh, because you don't want to just um, Dig, you know, dig up some some sod, and then go ahead and put your tomato plants in. You'll be dealing, uh, you'll be waging a, 
an endless war with those weeds that because seeds are in that seed bank. Uh, so they like a pH that's fairly acidic, 6.0 to 6.2 is ideal. Do not plant strawberries where raspberry straw, uh, strawberries or solanaceous, solanaceous plants have grown before. Um, plant both early and late bearing varieties for extended harvest. Uh, and you can plant in the fall. If planted in early spring, remove early flower buds and pinch back the runners to uh, to make sure that they get enough vegetative growth going uh, so that uh, the next year they'll be really strong. Uh, raised beds can work well. Uh, water uh, one inch per week at the root zone. And you would renovate the rows after harvest by reducing their width to a foot and covering plants with two inches of compost. So here are uh, diagrams of day neutral strawberries on raised beds compared to June bearers on a matted row. Uh, we all uh, are, are familiar, or at least have heard other people talk about it, if, if we haven't had the experience ourselves, of uh, some hungry vegetarians out there, and deer are one of them. Uh, so fences are an option, uh, wire mesh, eight feet high, uh, or plastic mesh fencing. An electrified wire professionally installed is, is, is a, uh, can, can be effective, uh, uh, or a high stone or wood fence. For small gardens up to 40 feet by 60 feet, a shorter enclosure made of snow fencing or woven wire fencing may be effective because deer don't like to jump into a confined space. Uh, repellents are another approach. Um, uh, however, uh, odors may guide deer and they of often just get used to a, a smell and it doesn't bother them anymore. So you might need to periodically change which repellent you're using. So, but people have found uh, uh, fragrant soap hung in branches to be effective. Uh, human hair is an option. A commercial organ organic repellents are available. Um, uh, saturated rags or string soaked in dissolved blood meal, bone meal, exotic animal manure, hot sauce, garlic oil. Uh, you, but you have to reapply because it'll rain and, and the smell will be gone. Uh, dogs or the scent of male dogs is another repellent. Uh, and and uh, there's, there's another uh, uh, approach that you might want to try. And that is that uh, simply by stringing um, a fishing line across uh, or, or surrounding your garden bed, uh, and uh, and having um, you might have some pie plates uh, or uh, old CDs or something spaced in between uh, at uh, at intervals. And uh, what happens is that the uh, if if it's if the string if the uh, if it's like three or four feet uh, tall that uh, that fishing line, the deer won't be able to see it and they'll walk into it and they won't actually be able to figure out what to do next. They don't because they can't understand that they could jump over it. After all, uh, they're not used to jumping over something that they can't see. Uh, that's an, a method that I've heard that might be effective. Uh, ground hog, hogs, which are also called woodchucks, are another uh, bane of gardener's existence uh, when they uh, make themselves welcome. Uh, and there are a couple of approaches for fences. You can use chicken wire, which you would want to bury a foot below the surface and then bend it away from the garden so that the woodchuck would not be able to dig its way into the garden. Or you could use an electric wire four to five inches high. And there's a list of repellents there. Uh, notice Epsom salts are one of the options. Ammonia soaked rags. Uh, soiled cat litter I've heard works, works quite well, you know, uh, with the urine uh, in that cat litter uh, repelling the woodchuck. Uh, in fact, you can put that repellent in the uh, in the hole and try to um, encourage the woodchuck to move move elsewhere. Uh, and all these uh, so th there are different approaches. You can either put the repellents near your garden um, bed, or you can actually put them in the holes if you found where the woodchuck uh, is is denning. Uh, uh, woodchuck woodchucks will have several uh, holes uh, uh, in in a kind of a network where where they've established themselves. Uh, you can also try motion devices such as pinwheels or motion detectors, which would trigger bursts of water and might even, uh, if you combine that with uh, uh, turning on a loud radio, that can be startling to a, a woodchuck. Uh, spreading thick molasses around their burrow entrances, uh, netting the woodchuck holes and plugging them with rocks, or uh, a more kind approach, planting alfalfa or clover, which is their favorite fruit, and hoping that they will uh, be uh, satisfied with that. Squirrels can be uh, a pest. Uh, sometimes uh, gardeners complain that uh, 
they they found uh, one bite taken out of each strawberry that they've uh, they were hoping to harvest. Um, at times, that can simply be because the squirrel is thirsty, and if you provide them water with water in a bird bath, uh, that might uh, be all you need to do. Uh, but I can't guarantee that. So uh, the uh, some uh, repellents would include chili pepper, garlic, vinegar, and peppermint oil. Uh, or netting the plants so that the squirrels simply cannot reach them. And uh, that's another approach for that can be taken with rabbits as well, just putting a, a wire mesh over your plants or uh, having uh, uh, the walls around the garden that are just too high for the rabbits to jump in. And some of the same repellents work uh, for rabbits, garlic, red peppers, um, the hot red peppers, uh, uh, blood, ammonia, and vinegar. Uh, Blue jays, crows, starlings, and grackles can make themselves unwanted as well, uh, and uh, can can uh, help be helping themselves to your produce. So, likenesses of snakes, hawks, and owls can deter them. Uh, scare eye and hawk-like balloons have a similar effect, uh, possibly. Although you know, when you have uh, uh, birds as intelligent as crows and blue jays, uh, you can't get much by them. <laughs> Uh, humming limes made of very thin nylon have been affected. They vibrate in the breeze. Aluminum pie plates and old CDs hung in the garden. Scarecrows is the traditional approach, and there's probably nothing more effective than having a dog doing sentry duty. Floating row covers are wonderful to protect, protect against insect pests. Um, so they allow air, water, and up to 85% of ambient light to pass through. Uh, harmful insects that we're trying to avoid uh, um, uh, uh, trying to limit our uh, examples of aphids. Uh, and here's the approach with aphids. You wash the plants with a strong spray of water. You're going to encourage native predators, and there are several of them, which we'll see. Or you can cover the plants with a floating row cover. Applying hot pepper or garlic repellent sprays can work for those uh, as well. For cabbage maggots that tunnel in roots and kill the plants directly, by creating entryways for disease organisms, you can apply floating row covers again, or set out transplants in squares of, of waxed milk carton, as the il illustration shows, or tar paper or carpeting with slips. Uh, that protects them more. Or mound wood ashes or red pepper dust around the stems. For cutworms, uh, try uh, surrounding with rolled newspaper collars an inch above and below the soil line, or grow plants in paper cups and cut the bottom half of the cup before transplanting. Uh, caterpillars uh, tried encouraging native predators and parasites, or you can hand pick them, just pick them off your plants, or again, floating row covers can protect them. Uh, Colorado potato beetles apply floating row covers once more, or use deep straw mulches and hand pick them, and the parasites and predators likewise will be one line of defense. For flea beetles, row covers again, or repel by spraying plants with garlic spray or kale and clay. The tarnished plant bug can uh, can be battled, uh, uh, can be fought with uh, keep just keeping the garden weed free in the spring and, and apply floating row covers, encourage native predatory insects. Japanese beetles, shake the beetles from the plants in the early morning. Uh, row covers, of course, will work as well. Set out baited traps upwind of your garden on two sides and at least 30 feet away and spray them with insecticidal soap. All those are options. And here are the beneficial insects that will help us uh, reduce pest populations. Ladybugs, it's the larvae that uh, feed on, on uh, aphids and other soft-bodied insects. And the, we can attract ladybugs with uh, flowers uh, that give them nectar and pollen. They are, they are pollinators, just like bees and butterflies. Uh, lacewing adults are also pollinators. Uh, it's the larvae that feed on aphids, thrips, scales, moth eggs, etc. cetera. Uh, Surfed flies are also pollinators. They, they, in fact, they pollinate strawberries and raspberries, and, they're, and the, the larvae feed on aphids in the early spring. Uh, predatory bugs, which prey on tomato horn worms and a host of other pests, um, are attracted by willows, buckwheat, corn, nectar, and pollen from many flowers, bunch grasses, shrubs, and other permanent plantings that provide shelter. And there are these wonderful parasitic wasps uh, that attack the eggs of pests and control many different garden pests, and you can attract them by giving them pollen and nectar plants. So pollinator gardens are, are, are not just for the pollinators, not just for the, for the plants. Perennial plantings and straw mulches provide shelter for spiders. Uh, these wonderful tachinid flies, they may, may not look appealing, but they are 
our allies. They are attracted by pollen and nectar plants as well. Uh, and just in general, uh, try to remember that these pollinators, whether whether we're talking about bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds, the ones that are uh, we perhaps feel the most fondness for, but moths, wasps, flies, and beetles are also important. Uh, Incidentally, a bat is not a pollinator here in the New England. It's, it, it does pollinate plants in the Southwest, but not here. Um, so uh, as a rule of thumb, it's good to have between five and 10% of the plants uh, in your garden should be pollinator plants to help uh, your garden plants um, set fruit. 80% uh, of all plants need pollinators to set seed and one third of our food is pollinated. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, pollinators make a big difference. On the right, you'll see a, a fruit that only had wind-borne pollen. So there was some uh, wind, uh, uh, some pollen coming from strawberry plants that reached, uh, strawberry flowers that reached this fruit and you know made some progress creating a fruit. The one in the middle only uh, didn't even receive wind-borne pollen. It just received its own pollen, which uh, didn't do much good. So you can see the importance of having uh, pollinators visit flowers and, and moving the pollen from that flower to a, a different uh, plant. Uh, environmentalists are asking us to reduce our lawns by at least 25%, and I think that's a manageable goal. Uh, and we can do that by uh, planting perennials, uh, whether it's trees, shrubs, or herbaceous perennials. And in fact, trees and shrubs can have far more flowers um, than, uh, than the plants that we're used to thinking of as pollinator plants. Consider gardening with children and giving them success experiences, and you will you will foster a lifetime of love and respect for nature, and uh, those children will grow up to be adults who will be uh, aware of the, the needs of nature and and de and defending um, the, the plants and animals that uh, uh, that we we need to be uh, uh, a voice for the for the, for the voiceless. Uh, so here are some uh, flowers that children might enjoy growing and some vegetables and fruits that they might have uh, uh, success experience with. And uh, real food is defined as the food that fundamentally respects human dignity and health, animal welfare, social justice, and environmental sustainability. These are all kept in mind in the growing of that food, as well as truly nourishing it's the producers, the consumers, communities, and the earth. So let's grow food everywhere. Uh, there's a lot of land available that's, that is, is unproductive, whether it's for food or for pollinators. Uh, and I'm uh, interested to know if you have any questions here. Uh, my uh, email address, info at johnroot.net. If you want, I can send you uh, whatever information uh, in particular you're looking for. And also don't forget that you can uh, watch this uh, program again of, on YouTube on the Acton TV uh, uh, station. All right, we're running uh, pretty short on time, but if anybody has questions, you can uh, either unmute yourself and ask or uh, chat and I will either speak for you or John can take a look at that chat. So. If you are starting a, uh, if you are looking to start a small garden, what would be some plants to uh, just get started with? Well, I think it entire it depends entirely on what you like. Uh, um, there you go. And uh, maybe some easy plants. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, beans are pretty easy, I would say, uh, and you can select either. Uh, you know, the bush beans or the pole beans. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Well, uh, again, I would say that, I mean, the tomato is the most popular plant. Uh, more people grow tomato than any, any other plant by far. So yeah. is it the easiest plant? Not necessarily, but I, but it's not that difficult either. Uh, and uh, whatever you... Um, whatever you're motivated to do you're more likely to succeed i think that's really the key to having a green thumb is uh you know if you're excited if, you know if you're eager uh if uh, you're going to pay attention you're going to want to learn from other people uh and go with it go for it <laughs> awesome uh so you talked about seed prices a little bit but uh how much does a garden generally cost or how much should you budget 
you know, you can uh, garden for virtually nothing. In fact, if you plant it, I mean, you, you know, you might have some uh, uh, some neighbors, for example, who, who save their seeds. And keep in mind that uh, as soon as you get going, you can save your own seed. So there might be some up, upfront chart, uh, expenses. Also, people often buy plants that are started for them from nurseries. Uh, and uh, so that's going to be an expense if you choose to go that route. But consider that you, if you do a little research, uh, you could start your own seeds, and that's certainly more um, more economical. Uh, you get a lot more plants if you start from seed than than buying a, a tray of six or twelve or whatever. So, uh, and there are so many resources that you can use uh, if you're saving your kitchen scraps. Well, there's your uh, uh, your fertility. Right, so you don't have to buy uh, compost if you're making it. Great. Any other questions? Not seeing any more in the chat here. Oh, hang on, I just got one. Uh, quite an informative session. Started planting last summer. Had planted cabbage, but it suffered significant damage from moth caterpillars. Would okay. it be a good idea to plant it again this year? And if so, what precautions should we take? Thank you. Sure. So uh, when I uh, was talking about all those different pests that can try to make a meal out of your leaves, virtually every one uh, was uh, deterred by floating row cover. So you might want to consider a cover, uh, some protection that's physical like that. Okay. I think, I think that that's, it, John, thank you so much for your extremely informative presentation. I know that I learned a lot. Great. <laughs> so um, again, if you're interested in uh, viewing this session, uh, you can do so through Acton TV's YouTube. And uh, John has made his email available uh, to you. So um, feel free to, to email him any further questions. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for joining me.